So today we are here with a most honored guest. I would say he's most known for this record or that record, but there's too many of them. There's too many, not just great records, classic, timeless. Yeah, appreciate that. Will be listened to forever kind of records. I mean, Miseducation of Lauren Hill, very high among those, yeah. seminal album. I mean, that's what I wanted to be known by. I didn't want it like, I don't care if anyone knows me, just know the music. Yeah, and it's, you I, mean, I mean, every you'll be hearing that at weddings, funerals, forever, yeah. forever. One of the fascinating things about Jay Pope here is not only is he a great maker of music, but an executive in yeah. the business, an A&R man, yeah. uh, and generally just considered to be a very kind and gentlemanly figure in this business. Tremendous respect and love to Mr. Jay Pope. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. It's been, it's been a couple of years, so yeah. it's nice to be, you know, be, be back. Yeah, it's yeah. The, the community aspect is really exactly. what's wonderful about it. Yeah, I like getting out of the studio. Uh, yeah, so let's let's kick it off with, um, you know, kind of early career stuff. But, you know, in, in the beginning I mean, and over the years, you've gotten some really big breaks from the heaviest people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Teddy Riley, Lauren Hill, Hans Zimmer, yeah. Dr. Dre. I mean, like the, the top of everybody. Uh, Big breaks are great, but you don't keep getting them unless there's a reason for it. What's the reason that you keep getting those breaks? Well, I mean, I think the number one thing is preparation, right? Meaning yeah. you have to really have to work at mastering your craft, whatever it is you want to do. I, I, you know, I speak to a lot of young people, and the one thing I always tell them, you know, they always tell me, how do I get in the door? How do I get on, right? How do I get on or how do I get in the game? The number one piece of advice I always give is master your craft. Because then when, you, when the opportunity presents itself, Right, because networking is the next aspect of it, right? So mastering your craft, be good at whatever it is you're doing. If you're songwriting, if you're producing, if you know if you're a producer and you make beats, learn how to play keys. Learn how to engineer. If you're an engineer, learn how to play keys so you understand tuning and you know what I mean and things yep. of that nature. So that way when opportunity presents itself, you're ready and you're right. more than prepared. And that's I think that was what you know, I'm just a living proof of it. You know, there was no YouTube when I was coming up. So there was all, so now to me, there's just so much more information to empower yourself with and make yourself bulletproof as whatever it is you do. You know what I mean? I, I meet engineers that are like, hey, you know, I do graphic design, you know, you know, you know, yeah, all these yeah. things and like, you know, you know, and so on and so forth. So these, to me, the next generation is almost more talented because there's more information out there. The ones who choose to really go get it. Right. You know how lucky they are too. I'm, yeah. so, I'm so jealous of any of y'all younger people. Oh yeah, you, we just had, had to figure it out. Yeah, you so, figure it out. You get you know, mix magazine or yeah, something and hope make, yeah. they write an article about compression or exactly, <laughs> and then <laughs> like, sit there. You know exactly. I mean, yeah. that's what it was. Being the music store, I was I was definitely a music store kid. I've told this story many times. I didn't have any equipment, yeah. but by because the the music store, uh, I I went to school, high school near Berkeley School of Music. There was a music store called um, E. Wurlitzer, shout out to E. Wurlitzer, because mm -hmm. that birthed me, that birthed uh, um, Jeff Basker, oh. came through there. Yeah. So, you know, a number of us came to, you know, through the music store. But the music store let me just hang out. Yeah. They let me hang out, they let me learn the equipment and play with it, so shout out to, you know, music stores. Yeah. You know, well, while be, we're here, be curious, yeah. you know. Shout out to Jim's House of Guitars, who yeah. basically, <laughs> they watched me when my parents were around. You know. Uh, so interesting to think about your career up until the early 2000s you worked uh really primarily on a lot of vocal albums yeah. right and like some of the big ones of course miseducation uh miseducation lord hill read the franklin dusty's yeah. child mary uh and then you kind of shifted gear a little bit later but before we get to the, that I, i'm curious as a producer how do you give direction on a vocal take to aretha franklin well, fortunately, Lauren wrote the song and Aretha just being, you know, just respectful of the songwriter. Sure. I think she's the same thing. She's a purist as well, right? Yeah. So she's just like, you know, I trust you. And I think because she trusted Lauren, I think she, you know, with with the vocal and melody, that's why. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where Lauren, she allowed, because I would say Lauren is the one who really gave her direction. You know, um, and in terms of me working with so many vocalists, I think for me, you know, one thing as a producer when you're coming up and you're learning, right? We work with acapellas, right? right? You know what I mean? Especially back then. All I, you know, I had some acapella records and this and that. So the way I even created tracks, you know, was very solitary the way I started. 
And then Teddy, Teddy helped shape me other ways, but he really taught me the difference between a beat and a track and a song. Right. So I think that's why I was so in, so much more interested in working with vocalists to begin with, you know, right. over rappers. And you know, I, I started working in more and more rap, but I definitely was more more interested in working with singers because of the melody and like what could I take the track on a journey, you know what I mean? Right, so I mean, are you like a, are you a big lyrics guy? Do you think about like the journey that's being told, the story of the lyric? Are you more interested in the structures of songwriting and how that works musically? Yeah, I was, I was a big, I, I think growing up, my hero is Curtis Mayfield. And I Me felt too. like he was one of the, like the gods of songwriting. Yep. And um, and obviously studied Holland Doja Holland as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, Smokey Robinson, so these great, you know, and John Lennon, you know what I mean? I mean, obviously, there's the fight between who love, who do you like, Paul or John? Right. I, I was a John guy, and then I met Paul because we worked with him with Kanye, and I was like, ah, like, <laughs> it's kind of funny thing. But anyway, I say that to say that I think I just the the storytelling aspect of songwriting. Yeah. You know, and I feel like that's one of the things that's a lost art right now. Mm -hmm. Like top line, so many, and we all know this. Like we know the people that get on the mic and just go into the booth and they just hum. And, and there's nothing wrong with that because you get melodies and so on and so forth. But just that craft of that, of the songwriting process of really, you know, laying an idea, living with it, coming back, studying it and so on and so forth. So, you know, what I mean, yeah. that's one of the things I'm trying to champion. You know, it's funny that does still exist and is completely prevalent in country music. Yeah. Country music is still 100 percent about the song, the storytelling, all that stuff. Yep. It's not necessarily my cup of tea, but I do have tremendous respect for the craft. Yeah. Of it. Well, you know, I, I have my different singers that I like in country music, you yeah. know, but um, same thing. Like Dolly Parton is one of my favorite all time yeah, songwriters. Yeah, yeah. And she wrote a song about a breeze, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it was amazing, you know what I mean? So obviously get on Sousa Island in the streams, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's how these places, these these songs that I even took from or sampled from sometimes they came from because it came from me studying these songwriters. Right. You know, that's cool. I put by the way, Curtis Mayfield is yeah. like maybe my favorite. Really? That's definitely one of mine. Uh, I tuned my guitar in F sharp minor. Oh, first really? Tuba, yeah, because I wasn't a guitar player. Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. And I saw that he did that. So I did that. Yeah. Yeah. I sorry, I should go in off the tangent. I was like, I can talk about 30 minutes about just like a yeah. <laughs> Curtis Mayfield's guitar style. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's what we're here for. Uh, so I'm interested after you go through this period where you're working with all these incredible singers, yeah. especially the most notable female singers of the last 40 years, right? A couple of them. Yeah, a couple of them. Uh, after that period, you seem to move kind of in your hip hop period where yeah. you did Eminem. And well, Dre, you know what I mean? I, yeah, think yeah. I connected with Dre. So I, I moved to LA actually um, to work with Hans Zimmer. I had scored two movies and knew absolutely nothing about movie scoring. So I was like, all right, I showed up on Hans' door. He let me in. That was great for like a year and a half, two years. Then Hans and his business partner had a huge falling out and lawsuits and all that. And I was starting to itch for the music industry again because I was doing a lot of like commercials and, you know, con and movie additional songs and movies and different things. So I, I think the itch for making music, you know, drove me back. And then I had met Dre. And then, you know, uh, within three weeks, I was on his personal production team. Yeah. And then that's that was at the heyday of M and 50 and game. And so we, you know, we dove in head first. You know, I think the first thing I worked on was game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, 50, 50. So when you're approaching a hip hop record versus a vocal album, yeah. do you approach the recording process of it completely different? I mean, what's, what's the difference between the way you approach those two types of genres? I would say it depends on the artist because all of them are different. Like, so for, in, for instance, like someone like an Eminem really likes to go off by himself and be isolated with the track. So we approach the track, obviously, you know, when we're, when we're making music every day, and especially in the Dre process, what I liked about working with Dre, it was like, don't forget it's Dre, but at the end of the day, still there's no rules. You know what I mean? Like, so I didn't have to like, we didn't have to sit there every day trying to make a Dre track. Right, It's right. like, we made a dope track and it was like, all right, then we make it in a, through a Dre lens. So with Dre, it was like, just making sure, you know, we made really dope music. Right. And then the artists would come in and they'd have, you know, a hundred tracks to pick from, you know? And then, um, but different artists require different things. So certain artists, Dre would be more hands-on. So we'd be working with directly Buster, 50, and we're more like, we're, I mean, I'm sorry, and would go in, off on his own, the other guys wanted to wanted the Dre and, and wanted us 
involved in the songwriting and, and sort of, you know, that was great, the collaboration process. Yeah. But M was a genius though, like M would, you, you, you give off a track, come back with three records in like, you know, however long, yeah. come back with three records later and you'd be like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. You know. I usually ask how do you inspire confidence in a singer, but it seems like you've worked with the, you know, like the ball and the singers ever who probably yeah. are showing up with some confidence. Like, I don't think Aretha Franklin is coming in with the cold sweat. Yeah. Well, Cooper. both, both. Because, yeah. you know, there's, I, I want to shout out this young lady who I think, who I've worked with recently named Amalu. You know, when I met her, she had one song, you know what I mean? That was just her, like, that she had just put out on the internet. Yeah. It was her skateboarding in pajamas. <laughs> and I found her and, you know, I did her EP and it helped get her a deal at Interscope. But same thing, I just, what I think what I look for is people who already have an identity, who have a sense of self. So maybe that's confidence, yeah. but also to me, it's just they have a perspective. Right. Like don't come to me as your producer to tell you who you should be. You know what I mean? I need, I need you to know that before we start. And yeah. you tell me that. So that's what I look for. But I'm getting into, like when they're actually in the studio singing, because it's such a vulnerable position. Yeah. Like more than any other instrument, the human voice, especially if it's your own song, too. Yeah. Like, you, you know you're going to be judged on it. And if you're successful, you're going to be judged on it on a global scale. And yeah. you're going to get all the all the, all the the props, but also all the haters. Yep. So when somebody's in the studio, do you, like, when somebody's at, at that level, the highest level of the business, do you get that vibe from any of them? Do they, do they have that kind of vulnerability, or do you think they kind of just worked it out? Um, I would say the majority of them have worked it out, but everyone's vulnerable, right? Everyone, depending on what they're going through in their career, sometimes you might be working with a singer who had a lot of success and then they're, they're declined. So right. they're trying to get back, you know what I mean? Like, so for instance, I work with Christina Aguilera, right? Who has the unbelievable confidence in her vocals. But you know, she already had tremendous success and was trying to like, okay, I want to get back there. So, you know, there was vulnerability, but in different ways, not in my, not in her vocal ability, right. but maybe it's like, is this song for me? Or is this, is this melody for me? You know, so the vulnerability showed itself in different ways, yeah. you know? Um, but I would say singing especially is, is still such an intimate and personal thing. Yeah. So, you know, as a singer, they're gonna always go through confidence issues. They're gonna have good days where they're killing it. They're gonna have bad days where they're not hitting the notes and you know so on and so forth so you know part of being a producer is being many many things being a cheerleader being a psychologist being a supporter being that you know the more you know you have to be there i've seen producers who break singers down i think that's never been my style yeah. i'm more of a, a definitely someone less hey we, we can hit it tomorrow like don't you know i don't want i don't want you in here stressing out you know right, what I mean? right, this right. should be an enjoyable experience yeah that's always been my approach so when you're doing tracks, are you shooting for the best? So let me rephrase this. Yeah. Do you want the best possible performance, like the most emotional performance, or do you want the pitch perfect performance? No, I want the emotional performance. I want the magic. Yeah. I want that, you know, the artifact. I want the thing that's going to be timeless. We can, we can, we can, we, you know, I, I, we can, we, we can figure it. some things out. Yeah. You know what I mean? But. Might I want be a the magic. Question. Yeah, I want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want the magic because that's the take. That's right. the that's the one, you know. And that might not always be pitch perfect, right. but it has the feeling. It has the emotion. And, and if you think of the best singers, some of the best singers are not the most technically profound. They're, they're the ones that convey that emotion. They're the ones that that crowd feels that they feel that, and the crowd is like, oh, you know what I mean. Yeah. And it's not always pitch perfect. It's not always. It's it's that it's the emotion. Yeah. So that's my that's always been for me. Do you track with auto tune on? Well, you know, I would say the modern version of the music business, you have a lot of artists that are very auto tune savvy. Right, right. right. So they have they not only do they track with auto tune, they know their settings. Right. I actually prefer to use it post. Um, I prefer you know let's get let's let's just go for it. Let's yeah. get it right. Let's you know that I. We know we'll comp it, and then and then I'll let me do, it. unless unless we're using auto tune as an effect. Right. That's different. But if we're using it, if I, you know, you know, just just on some tuning, let let's 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 get it down, and so forth. But this is the modern music industry. People are these 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 singers are accomplished. They're in the studio all the time. Sure. So they they know they they. It's funny. Many of them know their entire signal chain. Like yeah. I, I'll literally have you know artists come in and be like. Oh, I need a need to a two. You know, they they, they have their 
everything. Yeah. Down to the auto tune setting. I've, I've heard from producers that then that singers come in and try to sing as if auto tune is on. Like with their voice, just like really? kind of faking auto tune. He's like, no, don't worry about it. We have it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, so. I think it's interesting, actually, when you said you use it, when you use it as creative effect, because uh, obviously the two big moves of auto tune people know about natural sounding pitch correction. Yeah. And maybe then, a little bit of sheen on top. And then the, you know, the iconic sound that's like yeah. kind of, you know, become this cultural landmark. You put it on during tracking when you're using it as a creative effect? I, I do. I, I use it. And that's one of the things, you know, I was that's why when Ford asked me to talk, I was excited to talk about it because I I, I think of plugins or anything for that matter, but plugins especially, I think as tools to explore and to create. So I use it on all kinds of shit. Like, you know, whether I've, I got a sample off a record and I sped it up or something, the pitch is off and so forth. So I, I tune it. I'll tune 808s because I might have affected an 808 in a way that it's gone out of tune. You know, and yeah, I could sit there and try to, you know, put it in a sample and micro tune it. But sometimes it's I can just auto tune it and, and sometimes I'll create a whole new different sound with it. So it's such a tool of exploration that I just hope more people don't just get stuck into using it on a vocal and or this way or that way. Yeah. There's so many other applications for it. Many people don't know about tuning drums, you know what I mean? Which is which is which is definitely a hip hop thing that a lot of you know, a lot of people who make hip hop or even EDM sometimes are not, are not necessarily musicians. Right. They might be really great at making a beat or, or programming. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily musicians, so they don't know about tuning. Sure. And this is where auto-tune can really help save you and do magical things for you and really make a record where your tuning was all over the place. And now all of a sudden things are making sense, Yeah. you know? And there's still so many ways to break it that people haven't discovered. I mean, like the, the whole share effect yeah i mean it wasn't designed for that yeah you know what i mean yeah. like they just dimed it and and then yeah and then something something happened so yeah i mean that's always been my favorite thing about plugins yeah using them the way they're not designed to because you can find it's like a different instrument entirely and to me i love especially on the efx where you guys where they where you guys have put the uh the presets yeah now because you can go to like a mike dean preset or someone else's preset you can actually see what they edited and then from that, it, it's almost like a blueprint of making your own edit, right. making your own custom, you know, settings and so forth. Are you mostly using uh, EFX? Uh, just when I'm for media gratification. I use Pro when I'm. It, well, once again, it also depends on the artist. Right. So I mean, if I'm working with, you know, someone you know up here, yeah, I'm using Auto Tune Pro. Right. If I'm working media gratification, getting it done, EFX. If I'm working with song, you know, certain artists who know their settings, it's usually EFX. Okay. Cool. So, but I jump around. Right. Yeah. How, how often are you using it? How many tracks are you using it on? Everything. Everything. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's a staple. Right. I don't I don't think I have a track really honestly where it'd be probably hard to find a track where I don't have it in there yeah. on something. You know. How did you discover it? What was your your initial reaction when you you heard it? Well, you know, I came up in the day of tape and and you know you know syncing with Simpty and all types of sure. you know and flying sampling a hook to fly it you know what i mean right, all kind right, of shit right. so it was like yeah and back then you know you need to use even tide and harm you know harmonizers and different things to to try to you know do some pitch correction so it was like <laughs> you know what i mean and i think there are things that come along and that's why it's an you know i mean pro tools itself right pro tools came along it's an industry standard because it came along and it was like yeah. Auto tune was the same way. It's one yeah. of those things. And there, mind you, there are many things that tune things, right? Yeah. There are many different company and different company. But why is auto tune the standard, right? There are certain things that just become the standard, you know? What do you think it is the standard? Um, I, got, I mean, obviously, you have artists who popularize it like Cher and TI. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing. But I think the versatility, because you can use it to an extreme right. and you can also use it to, you know, for as a tool, just exactly for what it was intended for. And then, and and and, and I hopefully more and more people will keep discovering that it's so much more than that too. Yeah. You know, it's a very powerful effect. You know, when applied in different manners. So. I'm gonna ask about just some more industry stuff. I think yeah. we covered auto tune. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, if you guys want to try three free months, one free month of Auto Tune Unlimited, which is our complete suite. Uh, suite of vocal production software. You can grab one of those cards and we're all wrapped up here. Um, I, I want to ask you something about like kind of 
creative choices and work choices. Yeah. You kind of famously don't do a lot of records. Yeah. You, you've done like a lot of timeless classics, but then nothing else that year, right? Like there's some, some years where you're like a couple records, yeah, but it's they're all, all the good ones. So why, why is that? Always been quality over quantity. I always approach my career as like artifacts. Uh -huh. Like I never really sought out to like make a hit record, but I did want to make an artifact, something that could be here. Yeah. That could be, you know, when I'm 90 or something, I could put on and be proud of, you know. So that's always been my approach and my thought process. And, and to do that, it's not that I don't make a lot of records maybe in my own world, but as far as actually what comes out might be very, very select. You know, I'm very, very specific. And that's just because just literally that quality over quantity. And don't get me wrong, I know we're in the quantity game now right. and, and all that, but that's still just not my process. So are you turning down massive records all the time? I, I think at this stage, I'm just really select. So I don't, yeah. it's like, I don't even, I make it really hard to even get me to work. Right, 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 <laughs> You gotcha. know what I mean? So that's just intentionally. You know, I have my own, I have my own company and I have some artists of mine that I work with. But as far as like in the industry, it's very select people that I work. I just did a record with Brent Fias, like amazing artist. I love him to death. Um, I'll, you know, I'll pick my spots. Yeah. You know. So were you talking with your own company? You're talking about good music? No, I have a company called Workshop that I, I got funded okay. in, in a pandemic. I have a new company called Workshop. My partner is Dan Gilbert, uh, who's the uh, founder of Quicken Loans and um, the owner of the Cleveland Cavs. And oh, okay. we're based in Detroit. I have a headquarters in Detroit anyway. Um, you know, so a life, a music-based lifestyle company. Right. So, so tell us about what the company is up to. Well, we've, we've got about 10 artists that we're, we're you know, in the process of, uh, you know, finishing up paperwork. Yeah. Um, just actually the first one who I can say is Fresh, the artist formerly known as Short Dog. Many people know him because he used to uh, used to be affiliated with Young Money. Okay. So he's the first artist, Fresh. But I have I have 10 amazing artists working with. Uh, it's It's been a journey, like funding a company in a pandemic. Yeah. And also just switching gears from being a music producer and even an executive to being an entrepreneur and a founder. It's been a different journey and process. So I, I love, I'm loving every minute of it. Yeah. Yeah. You ever take a break of just like completely kicking ass at every, uh, <laughs> every part of the industry you're working in? Well, you know, I think if you, to me, the journey is to stay curious, to stay learning, yeah. to stay to, to, you know, and I, and I think I give that a piece of advice to everyone I know, like I wouldn't, I don't even know what I would do if there, you know, if I didn't stop every day being curious. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so at the, your company now, as the founder, are you also doing the A and R, or are you kind some of overseeing? Of it. It? Yeah. Yeah, some of it. Um, I have two really talented A and Rs, yeah. um, and then, and then also, I'm also still an executive at DistroKid, so I'm a, able to see so so many talented artists. You know. Yeah. I think I get so much talent, so much talent coming at me. It's like it's actually hard. The biggest thing is to be to really make a decision on who to work with, you know, because there's so much talent out there. So how do you make that decision? What are you looking for when you have to pick between two incredible talents? Um, the team, I let my, like the team, you know, we, I have a team of about eight employees uh, and we, you know, we work together to make those decisions. Ultimately, I might make the final decision. And then a lot of times it's the artist though too. Like we may, let's say it's narrowed down to five artists. Then we meet with the artist and, the, and it's like, you know, it's, then it becomes the character of the person, not only just the talent, but what's this person? What's, right. how's this, how's this human? You know what I mean? Right. And that's, you know, we want a good work with really, you know, people we want to work with, you know what I mean? So See, a lot of times artists might not realize it, but once you sign that record contract, you just went into business with this person. Yeah. And I've always said that, uh, you know, back when I was in playing in bands, being in a band, even like a local, like little rock band, it's like starting a small business with your four least responsible friends. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, like there's no drummer I've ever played with where yeah. I'm like, I'm going to start a company with them. Yeah. yeah. But as an artist, when you sign to a label, and it's like, the same you, thing. It's yeah. the same thing, but like, you guys are taking it seriously. You're taking it seriously your whole career. That's why you're there. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if anybody here is like a young artist, definitely be mindful and respect that relationship because you're hearing it right now the character counts reliability yeah, really yeah. all that kind of all stuff. That stuff professionalism because it is a business and it's um you know majors sit back right now and they they wait for people to have success and then they pick you know they can pick just who's already popping right we have a company that we're working with emerging talent and, and talent that's just getting going and stuff like that so the, the the investment is that much more riskier so that why the character of the person and the human 
in, 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 you know, in sync with the talent is that what is so important. So why is it that you take that approach that, that's quite different than the other labels where they're going after somebody who's already built a, an audience? <laughs> because and, the need, the need is there, right? The need is there. It shouldn't be the, the, someone that has amazing talent, but maybe they're not amazing at TikTok. Right. They, they don't get the shot because, they, you know, because they don't know how to promote themselves as someone over here. Because, but, you know, I, I still believe in the music industry in terms of investing in talent. Mm -hmm. That's the way it started. Now, obviously, I, I understand the major labels and market share, and they're playing a different game. But I can go back to be a purist and being like, let me try to find these artists here and get them to a point, you know? Yeah. If they want to go to the major route, great. We can, you know, let's go to the major route. Some artists may want to stay independent, but our job is just to help elevate them. So how do you find artists who aren't out there self-promoting by not, not do it? How do you how do you find them? Are you, people still sending tapes? Yeah, I mean every which way. I mean word of mouth. I mean a lot of a lot of still word of mouth. I have one A and R um, who I don't even know how she does it. She's just special. Like she's just she's an early state. She's a DJ, and she loves to play music people haven't heard before. So she has a way of probably combing through SoundCloud and however she does it. She's amazing. Um, and so I have some secret weapons and I've been doing it a long time. So right. a lot of relationships and I still think you still have to be connected. Relationships is still the biggest thing. I've been, I'm connected in every city, you know what I mean? You know right. what I mean? And it's still like, I may get a call from, you know, this person and, and be like, oh, I, you know, I got an artist from Cleveland, Ohio. We're like, oh, I got this young lady from that, you know, you know, from Cleveland, Ohio, you, you need to know about, you yeah. know? Yeah. So definitely still a, a, a networking, you know, networking thing for sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for a couple questions from okay. the audience. If we have a sure. mic. Shall we take this? Uh, yeah. Hold on. Hi, Mike. Sorry, where's my booth staff? Well, I can probably hear you. If they, uh, yeah. Can you, camera? can you help me out here? Do you mind handing this to people? Yeah. So let's take a couple questions. Anybody got a question for Che Po? Yeah, any questions? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. My question is, you've been a part of amazing amounts of success. When you're creating that in the moment of as it's happening, do you know it's going to be as big as it's going to be? Or do you hope? Does it like seem like a genie in a bottle, catching, you know, nothing in a bottle, that's what it's like? What's that experience? I mean, now I know. Um, or or, or you, you have a good idea when you got something special. Like, you know, it's like creating when we created Mercy. Like, I, I, I knew what that was. You know what I mean? I had the beat. Uh, so I found a kid in Arizona who was just doing like mixtapes at that time, who had a beat. And now as soon as I heard the beat, I knew what it could be. So I just, I took the beat with me and, and seven, you know, and I knew I needed to get the right situation for it. And I knew if I did that, I could make, you know, make it a moment. And so I, you know, seven months later, it became Mercy that you guys know, but you know, I heard it. It was just the kid who in Arizona, who had a mixtape beat. You, I mean, you could feel it. Yeah, I knew if, you know, I knew if we put the elements together, if I built up the production, if I added some more stuff to it, if I got the right combination of artists on it. Matter of fact, even before Kanye ever got on the record, I told Kanye, I'm gonna make this record so hot that you're gonna have to get on it. Thank you. Yeah. How are you doing? I was just wondering, um, preparing to you first for putting out projects, if you can think back to like your first, you know, your very first release, right? And, uh -huh. uh, artists nowadays you know us releasing music what do you think is is i don't want to say missing but what do you think that we can bring to, to make our music be more of a moment and, and kind of last a little bit longer than the span that's lasting right now it's really up to your creativity and innovation because you know especially if you if you if, if your resources are limited right what you're not limited on is your creativity and your ideas so you really just have to really try to think outside the box whatever that may be you know what i mean like um, I saw something recently that was really interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, someone had a flatbed and they were driving along performing on a flatbed, you know what I mean? And like making it near where, where something, an event was happening where they knew certain celebrities and so forth were gonna be there. So, you know, it was just, it, it was something that was like, whoa, what's that? You know what I mean? And whatever it is, I just think creativity is not limited. You know, budgets are limited, but creativity is not limited. I do think it is, as much as there's more information for you guys, that it is still difficult, right? Because more information, more access means more traffic. So how do you, you know, it's almost like if there's a traffic jam on the 405, how do you get into that, you know, 
that that fast lane, and and that is challenging. So, and you know, even as a company, even as a, you know, a founder of a new company, that is one thing we have to figure out. It's like solving that Rubik's cube. But I do think it is about first and foremost having amazing products, right, and then great marketing ideas and being creative and being innovative. Yeah. I think she had a question. Much. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, so you started workshop during the pandemic, and so I'm sure there was a bit of like virtual s sessions and stuff. I'm curious now that like the world is opening back up, how much are you utilizing like the virtual session aspect? If someone records their own vocals, do they send it to you or is it always in person? Um, no, we still, we still do it because I don't know that we're doing virtual sessions as much as we are sending stuff back and forth. As a company, we're all over the place, meaning I live in L.A. and I commute back and forth to Detroit. I have artists all over the place, like some in the Detroit area and around, but I have artists in L.A. I have artists in, you know, I have an artist from Houston. I have an artist in Columbus, Ohio. So and everybody in many cases is kind of independent. They have their own sort of work situation that they have. And then we have a collaboration situation. So it's a little bit of sending stuff back and forth in sessions, so on and so forth. But that but the virtual session was tough to me. Like during the pandemic, I did some virtual sessions myself and it was challenging. Yeah. Yeah. We did a camp like one day with like, I did, because I also do some K pop. And so we did this K pop. It was just weird to me. You know? So, yeah. Any more questions? I think we got time for one more. Don't miss your opportunities. One of the greatest record producers of all time. I know it. I'm, I'm all working, right. I'm that's all right. I know. That, by the way, that's the worst like being a comedian. Yeah, yeah, the guy's yeah. like, the funniest comedian of all time yeah. is coming up. You're like, yeah. Lower the expectations. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, how you doing? I'm good. I'm Devin. Devin. Um, how you doing? I just want to ask when you're when you're producing or when you're listening to like whatever your artists have created, is there something that you're listening for where you know like okay, let's build off of that? Is there something specific that you have in mind? Yeah, there, I I truly am. I actually just met with one of my artists yesterday, and we went through forty records, and. You know, he's, he's good at what he does. So all 40 records are good to some extent, but it's like, what are the moments? What are the unique moments? What are the special moments? What are the standout? What is the one that you put on? I press play. It doesn't sound like everything else. You know, what is the, you know, so I'm, I'm looking and that could be all different elements, meaning it could be, oh, this, this is the hook. Maybe this isn't the track, but this is the hook. So like, oh, cool. Scrap everything. Take the track. Ta I mean, take the hook. Let's find a better record for the hook. So on and so forth. This could be the beat. Like, but this, he's got one record where it's amazing record, but the hook ain't it. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right, let's scrap the hook. And, you know, and and it's tough sometimes because you, you know, you're talking with someone about their art. So you try to I try to build a relationship with my my artists that we can have these conversations without me being able to, like, hurt their feelings or something, because I, as I, you know, I need to be able to, to talk to them that way so that we can try to make the best possible. My job is to really Really, my job is to really just help them make the best possible music that they're capable of making, you know, and, and using my experience to, to help, you know. Yeah. Cool. Well, well thank you so much yeah. for taking time thank out you. of your, uh, your day to come yeah, and visit us. Thank you. This was fun. Such a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Once again, everybody, your little cards over there. You get a free month of Auto Tune Unlimited. Use it on every track. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for coming.